Well, it looks like it's showtime. Uh, once again, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Keith Krieger. I am, I wear a couple of hats here at the college. Um, I am a program director for technical training on the continuing ed side of the house, which means that I help manage the computer applications training over in Rainier for full day classes over there. I also am the technical training coordinator for staff development. So part of my job within staff development is to come in and do a couple brown bags every season. Uh, we're going to talk about Windows 7 today. Uh, Vince Miller over in the corner who is the project manager for the rollout of Windows 7 has joined us today to take care of any questions. Um, the uh, be a good time to check cell phones unless you have a really cool ringtone that you want to demonstrate for everybody right now. And this will be taped by the way so if you get that ringtone we'll get your ringtone on tape too. Uh, Schedule today, we run a little bit less than an hour here over the lunch hour. Uh, stacks, provi stacks provided by staff development, so please help yourself. And all of these, again, are archived out on the EdTech Center website, so you can view these at a later date. Any of the brown bags that we have hold during the term are videotaped and archived so that they are available anytime you want to see them. Questions, feel, please feel free to jump in at any time. Questions are fine at any time, uh, regardless of the size of the group. And we've also left evals at every table here, so please give us your comments at the end of the show. Would be much appreciated. And if you have any specific questions about what we've talked about today or technology for faculty and staff, please feel, feel, please feel free to drop me a note up here on the overhead. Be more than happy to get with you and answer those nagging questions that you've had out there. All right, so we don't want to do that one. Um, so what we'll talk about is why we're moving to Windows 7 here on campus, uh, the migration process, how it will affect you all personally on campus, and then demonstrate some of the newer pieces and parts of Windows. So the first thing we talk about the why piece. So those are the three numbers that really determine the why, why we're doing this now. The first number, 2012, is obviously a date. And depending on who you talk to at Microsoft and when you talk to them and the questions that you asked, but at some point, Windows XP will enter what is called into life. It's no longer supported. So how long has XP been around? Any ideas? 10, 12 years. Very good. About 10 years old. So it's getting rather long in the tooth. And Microsoft says, again, depending on who you talk to and when you talk to them and who you talk to, at some point they will make XP end of life, no more updates. Sometimes it's 2012, sometimes it's 2013, sometimes it's 2014. So we've picked this date as the date that we need to shoot for, for that to happen. 700 is the number of unique software applications that we use on campus. So that could be things like Microsoft Office that everybody uses. It could be a specific piece of software, as an example, that the Writing Center uses, or the Mass Re Resource Center uses, or somebody in the Physics Department. So we had to test all 700 of these on Windows 7 to find out if there were any that were not going to work, any that didn't work well, uh, any that the vendor said, we're never going to update that. And we had to determine who had those, who was using those. We inventoried all of the software on campus to try to get a feel for if we had any problems here, any showstoppers. 4,000 is approximately the number of computers on campus, more or less. So in order to do this testing and migrate all of the computers on campus, by somewhere around this date, we have to start now. Over the summer, this past summer, we had a pilot program with about 100 people who volunteered and said, yes, I'll take Windows 7. 
I can test it in a production, a real world environment here at the campus and see what kind of problems we find. Once that pilot program was over, information services began to contact groups on campus, departments, and start to schedule the migration. So here's what migration means for you. Information Services has that discussion with the department. They go in with that inventory of software and hardware. Within any one department, there's going to be three rough groups of users. So the first group of users that will probably get migrated first will be those folks who have up-to-date hardware, something that we purchased here at the college within the last couple of years, and that has software that doesn't cause problems with Windows 7. So that'll be the first group of users to go. There also may be within the department those folks who have software that works but they're running on older equipment. These people have to wait until that hardware gets replaced. Typically as part of the technology purchase cycle that we use here at the college. The third group of people are those folks who have some of those applications that will not run under Windows 7. These folks get to wait for a couple of things to happen. Either the vendor fixes the software or we find a replacement for that piece of software. So the process is information services has a discussion with department heads and with this inventory sets down with them and says, okay, when is the best time to migrate the folks in your department based on which category they fall? Prior to, th after that discussion, the folks who get migrated will get a checklist of things that need to be done before the migration happens. Migration happens overnight across the network. No different than our software updates now. You leave the computer on on Tuesday nights and the updates take place silently across the network. So you'll get a checklist of things that you'll need to pay attention to before that migration takes place. Your own work documents will get backed up and then restored after the migration. Personal documents, music files, picture and video files that are personal, that are not JCC work documents, should be backed up by you before the migration happens. It's probably a good idea. Any kind of critical files would be a good idea to be backed up before the migration happens in any case. But any kind of those personal documents that are not work related, that are not college related, you should take care to back them up before the migration happens. After the morning of the migration, somebody from Information Services will um, meet you at the very beginning of the day so that when the computer comes up, they will do the post-migration tasks. And depending on um, the kinds of software you might have, um, your particular setup, typically that meeting and that post-migration configuration takes anywhere from 15 minutes to an hour. So what, again, information tries to do is make sure that there's little disruption to work as possible when you move from XP over to Windows 7. So questions about the three categories, about who falls in what group. Vince, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, covered. Okay. A couple things that we have found that are showstoppers for the application. Uh, if you use banner imaging, that is if you use the piece of software that allows you to scan a document, convert it to a file that then gets placed into banner, banner imaging is not supported under Windows 7. So those folks, of which there are about 350 on campus, they get to wait until the vendor updates that piece of software sometime in the middle of the year. 
So if everything goes according to plan, then about this time next year, is when that will be completed. Obviously, there's going to be some big jumps in that number because during breaks will be when labs get updated, when we do huge numbers of workstations at one time. But right now, it's department-based, few at a time. So it will be very spotty. So in, in your department, there may be computers with Windows 7. There may be computers with Windows XP on them. Yes, sir. Um, when they migrate everything to 7, are they going to go with Office 2010 or stay with 27? The plan is, is to do one thing at a time. So we'll get everybody to Windows 7, and then we'll start to look at Office 2010 after we bring everybody up. It was just when you add, when you do this level, to do both of those updates at one time seem to be give us the potential for more problems than if we moved through one completely and got everybody stable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 2010, Office 2010, though, is very good. It works well. It's very stable. Uh, and since we are a Microsoft shop here at the college, you can, for your own personal use, buy Office 2010 through the college. It's $9.95 to get the suite. We won't have a pilot for that one, unfortunately. Sorry. But if I have to get used to the other one, I need to, okay. to know when. So. Okay. Yeah. You're still a little bit away. You're still a little bit away. So is, are any of you on t all Windows 7 yet? Anybody there yet? Just at home. Just at home. Work. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. So any other questions on migration, what's going to happen? The, after the migration is done and after Information Services completes their post-configuration uh, work, you'll get, a, you'll get an online survey to give Information Services some feedback about how the process went for you. Because obviously if we're looking at Office 2010 and we do this same kind of numbers, these 4,000 computers, then it would be helpful to know what needs to be fixed for that migration as well. Good. No other questions on that piece. Vince, did I miss anything? No, All right, so let's see what's new. I'm going to log into my desktop. If I can get the password correct. Be seeing something there. Oh, there we go. I've been in meetings all day. I apologize for whatever condition the desktop is in when it appears. Not too bad. Get this out of the way. And just clean things up here. Now you can see that we really don't have a whole lot of differences in the desktop. And I'm going to move some things around here to make it look as close as possible to what you all will see after a migration. And you can see docked over on the bottom, let me do one quick thing here. I 
don't know if that'll capture the remote, so we'll find out. All right, so standard taskbar at the bottom. The big difference that we'll see, we'll see two large differences here in how that taskbar works. Number one, we no longer have a start button. We've got a little round thing that if you hear people talk about it is called the Windows Orb, which even makes less sense than the start button. But we have, if we hover over that, where we would typically find the start button, we still get a tool tip that will pop up and say this is the start. The other thing that Microsoft found after 10 years of XP is that people had problems with cascading menus. That is, the old XP style menus, I'm going to flip back to XP here for a second, that we start here and we go here and we go here and if we um, try to jaywalk, that is if I try to go from right here over to the utility manager, sometimes it doesn't work or we'll lose the menu or things will disappear. As we all get a little bit older and we have a little less fine motor control, it's harder and harder to get these menus to pop up. And then we have issues with people who never throw anything away, and we have three or four layers of these things. So we're all familiar with folders. We're all familiar with how that works. So the Start button, Start menu, now gives us a folder view. So that instead of having to navigate multiple cascading menus, a single click of Microsoft Office in the menu exposes everything just like a folder does. So a little bit easier to find, a little bit easier to work with. You'll also see over on the right hand side of what is now the start menu, commonly used objects. And for those of us here at the college, what will happen over the course of the next year is that some of these pieces will change and will be JCCC specific. A link to InfoShare, a link to MyJCCC, some things that we use every day so we don't have to clutter up the desktop with a shortcut. The other thing you'll see is there are no more My Things here. Where we're used to XP showing My Documents, it's just Documents. Instead of My Pictures, it's just Pictures. In a little bit we'll see that they're back. And there's a reason why they're hidden now. But Microsoft decided to move away from the My Things. The, so that's the big, big difference in how we find our way around installed programs as well. I'm going to back up one level here. You'll also see that we now have history. So Internet Explorer always remembers where we have been. Well, the Start menu now remembers all of our recent files. So that if I look at my PowerPoints, if I click on PowerPoint, I see all the recent files gathered here without having to power, have PowerPoint open. Makes it a little bit faster to find recent work. The idea to keep in mind here is what Microsoft tried to accomplish with this is to do two things. Hide tools when we don't need them, but make them easy to get them back when we need them. And just like Internet Explorer, give us access to what we've been working on. Give us access to history. Internet Explorer remembers, why doesn't Word remember just as easily? So again, we have that taskbar, set of taskbar buttons down here. And you may be able to make out that the taskbar buttons are stacked. I've got multiple Excel files open here. And the user interface simply stacks up all of the icons for each one of the open files. If I hover over it, it gives me a jump list that shows me what's currently open with any one of those. If we were actually at my computer rather than remotely accessing it, I would actually get to see thumbnails of each one of these files. So instead of just looking at a file name, I can actually look at a very small thumbnail of the file itself. So we'll bring up a couple of these. And we'll bring up a bunch of these. All right. So I run full screen. I don't 
have small windows here. This is actually a laptop, so my screen real estate is somewhat limited. So rather than have a bunch of small windows that I have to move around a lot, I simply keep everything full screen. If I need to see the desktop, if I need to be able to very quickly get to the desktop, how do I minimize everything here? How would we do it in XP? Pardon? One at, a time. one at a time. I could do it one at a time, yes. <laughs> that gets kind of to be a drag when you have 40 or 50 windows open. Yeah, in Windows 7, I've got, it's probably hidden behind the lectern here, but there's a bar that sits right by the clock. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't say anything, it's just a tiny bar that if I hover over it, I'll get a tooltip that says show desktop, and when I single click it, it simply minimizes everything. Single click it, bring it back, and returns everything. Now I can still use old style Windows XP shortcuts, so when you get back to the office and you look at your keyboard, on either side of the space bar is a key with a window logo on it. And I can do that window key in M and minimize everything to the desktop. That works in XP as well. They simply have carried those over. In XP, do I just have a desktop icon down there in the quick start? You click that and you've got it. That's right. That's gone. So the little bar in the corner does the same thing. little bar in the corner does the same thing. Actually, the little bar in the corner does go, goes one better. If, again, we were working on my desktop, then hovering over that bar would make all of the windows transparent, and I could see the desktop without having to go there. So window in M minimizes. If I want to unminimize, if I want to bring everything back into its previous I add shift to it. Shift reverses that. So instead of windows and M, it's windows and shift and M, brings everything back into the previous configuration. Those window keys have been on the keyboard since 1995, more or less. They just never tell us what to do with them. If I needed to uh, walk away from the computer, bring up the screensaver, force it to go to a password, if I want to lock the keyboard, it's window and L. We'll lock the keyboard and force that password. Um, so we've got some ways to control windows and screen management here. Now the other thing we can do, here's, our, here's the question, here's the scenario. I, need, I want to compare these two Excel files side by side and I want to make them exactly half of the screen. Exactly half of the screen. So how would I do that now? Drag them, I guess. Yeah, lots of gymnastics, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of dragging corners and getting things here and there. Well, if I come up here and grab the title bar, title bar shows me the, not that, but the actual title bar of the document. If I press and hold in that title bar and drag it so that the cursor touches the edge of the screen, it automatically changes that to half of the window size and docks it. Bring up my other one, grab it, notice how it goes to full screen, grab it, touch the edge of the screen, it automatically gives me half of the screen real estate. Touch the edge of the screen of the, okay. Yeah, so what I'm doing here, I'm grabbing this title bar to move the window around. And as soon as the cursor, as soon as the mouse touches the edge of the screen, it automatically docks and automatically takes exactly half of the screen real estate. What if I didn't want it docked? What if I wanted multiple windows up there and I just wanted to move them around and keep them all small? Seems like when I touch that top bar, it, it blows up and fills the whole screen. So if here's the other piece, if I come up here and touch and press and hold the title bar, and drag it straight up into the top edge. Oh, it keeps wanting to bring up the... On, on, in your situation, when you touch the top edge, it maximizes everything. There we go. Now, if you're really wanting to control them, we can still use the old style shortcut. So I can come down here to the taskbar and right click it. and I can stack them all. I can cascade them. That's probably where you want to go. Right. Yeah. Right. 
that still works. Works in XP, works over in Windows 7 as well. And then when I size each window individually, because I'll typically have windows of different sizes, some narrow, some short, it won't, the, the new 7 won't override that once I click on that shortcut button. Okay. As long as you, as long as you resize your windows, and then at the end of the day you close these and shut Windows 7 down. When, if it's well behaved, when you bring it back up, it will remember the last window size. If it's well behaved. Some pieces of software are not well behaved. So you'll end up with funny kinds of behavior in there. So again, what Microsoft's tried to do here is make this whole idea of managing multiple windows a little bit easier, less of a problem to actually move around and control. Good, good questions. Now the other shortcut we have and the other change here is when I want to get to my computer. That is when I want to get to a look at all of my folders and all the network drives I have access to and all of those pieces. So how do you all find my computer right now? How do you get there? <coughs> My computer, yeah, you can do, that's one way, yeah. Any other ways? Icon on the desktop. Um, well, let's say I don't want to use the mouse and I can't see the desktop. The window key, E for explore. If I do window and E, I always get to my computer, regardless of what else is going on on screen. Window and E always gives you that. And the nice thing about doing it that way is that I always get to see all of my mapped network drives, all my shares. I get to see access to the DVD drive. If I have a floppy disk drive, I get to see all of those on the right and my folder structure on the left. I'm sorry, what do you mean window and E? Window and the letter E on the keyboard. W what window? Where is the oh, on the keyboard. Oh, at the, okay. Yeah, on the keyboard. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I never noticed it. All right. Okay. Yeah. They just... They just never tell us what the window key does. Okay. So, so the. Want me to walk on the laptop? <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I never used to know. Yeah, I never used it. They've been there since 1995. I know, I never used it. <laughs> Nobody ever told us what they do. All right. So you can you see. Mind going over the E, M, and L again? Sure. M minimizes everything. L will lock the keyboard, force a password. E for explore. And then to unlock the keyboard, you would just do the same thing again? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pop up and say control alt delete to enter your password. Oh. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we see over here on the left is that we no longer have just something called my documents with a bunch of subfolders. We have this idea of a library. And within the library, we have documents and music and pictures and videos. What else is missing over here that we would typically see if this was XP? Plus signs by all of the folders that have stuff in them, right? Now, again, because they've tried to hide tools that we don't need until we need them, as soon as I come over here and hover, all of a sudden we'll get diamonds pop up beside each one of those objects that have subfolders. And when I click one of the diamonds, I'll reveal the subfolders, and we see that now there's my documents. These are built in by Windows, by Microsoft, to be backwards compatible. There may be pieces of software out there that expect to find my documents to save or open things. And they could exhibit problems if they couldn't find my documents. So they put them in here 
to assure those older programs being able to find it. These are transparent. If I put something in my documents, it shows up in documents. If I show, put something up in documents, it shows up in my documents. This is just a pointer to the original. And again, there to assure that we can still have software that works correctly with it. How do you all make a folder inside of my documents? Or do you all just not do the folder thing and it just everything just gets dumped in there in one big happy family? You don't put anything in my documents, put everything on a separate drive so it doesn't get infected with viruses. Okay. Viruses so, always reside on the C drive. So all your important information should be elsewhere. Okay. So in that other location, how do you make a folder? Just go at the top and click new. New folder. Okay. Yeah, we do right click, we do new. The right click still works. Right click, new, folder, that still works. Um, again, instead of having to do three clicks to build a new folder or to find the file menu, they finally just given us a single button up here called new folder so that I don't have to look any farther on the single click away from building something. I put my hands on the keyboard. and I build that brand new folder. Now, we also are missing that familiar menu at the top, aren't we? File, edit, view, tools, and help. It's still there, but again, with the philosophy of hide it until you need it. Oops, not that one. If I tap the Alt key on the keyboard, there's that old style menu. Alt. Now, can I have something else? See, here is another issue I have. Now, I use my documents. I'll put folders and just plain files in there. And I notice everything is alphabetized, and when you did the My New Folder, it jumped up to the M's. I can't seem to be able to drag. I always look at the view by icon. So if I go up to the lower upper right hand mm -hmm. corner, view, mm -hmm. I prefer to view the little pictures. Yeah, by medium icon, say. That's how I work. Mm -hmm. Medium icon. I can't drag folders and files to wherever I want. They, they make me, you know, they stick where, you know, in the alphabetized list. How do I fix that? Well, the, let's rearrange here. By default, everything is arranged by name. So if I hover over this column here, I can reorganize. I can choose to sort by size. But see, I really don't want to necessarily rearrange and sort everything. I might be ha you know, fine with the alphabet mm -hmm. size, but I'm making new folders or I'm changing things in there and I want to temporarily move them in between others for my own mm -hmm. reasons. Mm -hmm. How you want to just kind of have a free form wherever they go. Right. And there seems to be no right click, uh, do it however you want anymore. At least I can't find it. Um, if I do tiles, will tiles let me do this? If I just want to put something someplace else. We would have to, what we'd have to do is look over here into organize and search options and see if we can find a spot that will turn off any of the sorting for you. And I'd have to look at that because I'll so, talk. So basically, it's not an easy process anymore. That was a step back. It's not a single click yeah. kind of process. Not a single click okay. kind of process. Hey, what's in the arranged by yes. it's all by folder, or is that? That's still alphabetized by, yeah. yeah. So something to look at. Something to look at. Send me a note. Okay. Send me a note and remind me, and I'll have a look at it. All right, so I can build these brand new folders. And notice what else we can do. Let's get a single file here. Uh, I've got a PDF here. I want to email that to someone. So what is the typical way that we email a document to someone? Attach it. Attach it, yes. 
And how often do you run into the situation where you start an email message and you say, I'm attaching this document, you should take a look at, and you click send and you realize two seconds later that you've forgotten to attach the document again. Well, if we turn the process around, here's the document I want to send to someone. Notice that I have an email button up here at the top. So the process works exactly backwards from what we're used to. When I click email, it starts up, and again, this works in Outlook. It automatically attaches the document to the email, and now I address it and send it. It's not going to work with OWA. It's not going to work with Gmail or Yahoo Mail or any of those web-based mail tools because it has no way to know to go out and find your OWA account or your Yahoo account to do this. But if you're on campus and you're using the full version of Outlook, you can get around the embarrassment of yet again sending another email with no attachment by finding the attachment first. Same way, we can find a group of folders. Well, let's find something here. Um, depending on how the computer is configured, you'd also see a button at the top called Burn. So I could burn that set of folders to a CD or a DVD without finding and dragging and setting up the brand new folders. Select them and burn them in a single step. All right. The other things we've been given here is a preview pane. That last button on the right-hand side. And it's a little bit smarter preview than we've had in the past. Let's find, so if I find an Excel file and click it, I get a preview. But now the preview is clickable. It's, I can navigate it. I can move around. I just can't edit the preview. So if I'm looking again inside of a folder and I have a number of like-named files, preview simply lets me look at them very, very quickly. I can preview PDFs without opening them. I can preview Word documents and navigate through them. I just can't edit them. Now, these are kind of business work-related tasks here. How many of you have a digital camera? And what happens when you take a digital camera on vacation? How many photos do you come back with? Hundreds. hundreds, hundreds and thousands of pictures. And then when we get back, we find that we have 10 photos, all of the same scene, that all look kind of the, almost the same, but not quite. Well, what they've done in this version is give us a little bit easier way to manage digital content. So if I click the chrysanthemum here, I get a strip across the bottom that gives me information about that image. When it was taken, so if this was taken off of a camera that puts the date and time information in there, I get that. I can rank these. I can give them star ratings. Imagine again, you've got 10 photos there. It's all the same scene. One of them is better than the other. I can assign star ratings to this content. And the nice thing about doing something like this is that I can then view everything by how I've rated it. Up here at the top where we have arrange by, I can arrange digital content by what kind of rating I've given it. So instead of looking at 10 versions of almost the same photo and trying to figure out again which one you like the best, I simply rate them once and arrange them by how they're rated. I can also I can tag them, and I can do multiple tags. So I could specify on the jellyfish photo, I can do multiple tags. And then I can sort by tag. So
so that if I go through all of my digital content and it obviously fits in multiple categories, I can let Windows categorize for me. Yes, sir. Can it also sort by the embedded GPS content? Assuming, let's take a look here. It's going to give us, we don't have any location embedded here. But the ones taken on smartphones do have. Correct. Let's see if there is a property. So we get a whole lot of information from the camera. What we'd have to do is see if a camera that did have GPS embedded information in there would also let Windows pick that up as well. Certainly be useful to stalkers. Or, hey, I want to go back to the same place that I took that photo. Yeah. Because we go back to places and it's nice to find that exact spot again. So we do have the opportunity here to manage digital content. And you saw how I could hover over that bar that separates the two here so I can make very small thumbnails and very large previews or vice versa. So again, it makes it a little bit simpler to, to view content. Yeah, let me show you another little piece here. All right, if I tap the window key, Start menu pops up, cursor's blinking into the box that says search programs and files. So as an example, if I wanted to look at, if I wanted to start Word, if I just simply start typing Word, it's going to find all of the matches that it knows about that starts with that piece of text. My programs, control panel objects, documents where that string of text is in the file name pictures, so if I know, if I know some part of that file name that contains the string, I can use this to find the content. I no longer have to spend time sifting through documents to find it. And if I actually just want to go out and see where it is, then I can actually have, I can right click that item that's found in the search and tell Windows go out and show me exactly where this thing was located. So it's a little less hard, uh, it's a little, it's easier to find things, a little harder to lose things because as long as I know part of a word in the original file name, I can let Windows Search do that for me. Yes, sir? Does it maintain an interactive uh, uh, index of everything on the drive to do that? Because that's a lot faster than the standard search. Yeah, there's indexing going on all the time. It's much better than the indexing was in Vista. Doesn't take as much from resources, works silently. When you're working, it falls back. But yeah, the indexing is much, much better. Mm -hmm. So we can use that very quickly to find pro files and programs. All right, here's the scenario. I have somebody new, you have somebody new to Word or Excel 2007. You need to give them some help. They're having problems finding a button up on their toolbar. We could describe it. We could get on the phone and try to help them find it. We're going to send them a picture. How do you all do a print screen? Print screen button. Print screen button, very good. How do you take a print screen of just a window? If I just want, alt print very good. If I do alt and print screen, I'll just grab the active window. Now my goal here is to get a picture of the toolbar. I don't need to send them the whole thing. So what Microsoft has embedded in this version of Windows is a screen capture tool. It's called the snipping tool. And there's two ways to find the snipping tool. Here's the hard way. All programs and accessories. And I can finally get to the snipping tool. Now, if I know that it's, that is its name, 
I start typing the word SNP, and the snipping tool comes up to the top because that's a unique name. So snipping tool, take a moment, pops up. It's not obvious up here, but everything in the background is dimmed. And it says drag around the portion of the screen you want to capture. Notice that we have a crosshair, and I press and hold and drag. And I get a picture of exactly what I want to capture. Now, in addition to what we've done here, Notice that I have some tools up here at the top. So I'm sending this to someone, and I'm saying, here's the save button. So I have a highlighter, so we can highlight the save button. And if they don't get that, then I can use a pen tool and draw big, weird arrows on things. Say, here's the one you want to click. You know, you make it very obvious for people. And then if I want to email it, I've got an email button. Starts up Outlook and embeds the picture into the message for me. I use this all the time on campus. People ask me, hey, I can't find this, or how do I do something? You take a quick screen grab of it, put some highlighting on it. Sure. Sure. Oh, let's just do a new one here. So I'll, I just dragged a part of, across part of the uh, object that I wanted to capture. Here's my highlighter. So I just press and hold and drag and highlight. But Here. did you have to do something to get to snipping tool or just? Well, again, I could, to get to the snipping tool, it's an accessory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's how you bring it up. Change the pen color, draw circles around things, oh. send it to the people, or I could just copy it. Now, what I do with these, knowing that I'll probably get asked the question again, is to come over here and save it. So I have a whole library full of screen grabs like this, so when I get asked the question again, I just pull that screen grab out and send it along. To do the screen grab, you have to go to Snipping Tool first. Mm -hmm. so, you, so you go to that first, and then you can just exactly. uh, encircle whatever you want. Oh, that's fabulous. Before, I would do, yeah. Alternate, mm. print screen, and then you'd have to put it in, in Word. Shop and do that. Oh, wow. Okay. It's built in. It's built in. Uh, here's a money making. Here's a money making. If y'all want to get very fabulously wealthy, uh, what's this button do? Saves things. Now, by by telling me that, I know that one thing about this audience is that you all are old, because you know what that thing is. So, what is that thing? <laughs> And who do you, you know, when was the last time you saw a floppy disk, right? This morning. This morning. Some, so we still use them. Give it 10 years and nobody will know what that button is. I've already had somebody. Eight inch floppy. The big, big ones. Yeah, yeah. So as soon as people forget what that thing is, I had somebody last year say, oh, it's a big screen TV. And it's no, it's a floppy disk button. What's a floppy disk? So you go through this. That's right. That's right. So if you develop that icon and then license it to Microsoft, you can retire tomorrow. So just a money-making tip for you. Mm -hmm. All right, so the other thing we have, another tool that they've embedded here that might help your day-to-day -day work. Scenario is you get to the end of the day. You're ready to leave. The phone rings. You need to call that person back tomorrow morning. What is the thing that you're going to do to make sure you call them back? Make a note. And with what? A sticky note. A post-it note. And so we walk around campus, and if I look over people's shoulders on campus, they have this halo of sticky notes stuck to the monitor. Now we've got sticky notes here. It's an accessory. It's called sticky notes. And you can, again, you can do it the old style way and actually find sticky notes. Or since you know the trick, you just start typing the word sticky, and you get sticky notes. Now you can see when that comes up, I can have multiple notes. I can change their size. I can right click and change their color. I can copy and paste into them. And they don't go away until you click the delete button. So I click the plus sign. Very good. Thank you, Zach. I click the plus sign. I get another note.
sticky note buttons down here in the taskbar. If I simply want to put them away, I click the sticky note button, click the sticky note button again, they all come back. But you can close your computer and leave your sticky notes on your, up on your screen? Mm-hmm. Okay. If I shut down, come back tomorrow morning, click the sticky note button, they're all back. Commonly used bits of information, extensions, phone numbers, pieces of information that just don't have a good fit elsewhere that, but you need to remember, I can capture them all here. It's built into the system now. Then you can cover your whole screen with sticky yeah. notes, and, and then you, and, but then to get rid of them, you got to delete them, right? Or I just, I just click the sticky note button again, and it puts them away. Yeah, 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 you don't have any one at a time thing unless you get very clever and stack them all up and be very artistic about mm -hmm. how they look. And you could spend many happy hours getting these things to look mm -hmm. exactly the way you wanted. <laughs> yeah, but they get old, they get tattered, they get lost. Here you let the computer do what it does best, which is keep track of all those random bits of information that we never can quite find a place for. So again, two things that are built in now that we don't have to go out and buy extra software for that have functionality that use we might find a use for day to day. So other questions or ideas about what you've seen today? Or about the migration process? Yes, sir. I did find something online about the uh, aligning the icons so to, for your question, aligning those icons to the grid. And there's a, there's a whole Wikipedia page about things that are missing in Windows 7. <laughs> Which is and turning the grid off. I think that's one. They actually disabled the ability to be able to move those icons. Mm -hmm. You can do that, I guess, on the desktop. but. Yeah, on the desktop you can. That was in a folder. Yep. There was some reason that was given that in Windows XP that some of those icons would overlap and would cause mm -hmm. trouble sometimes. I don't know, but you know what's another serious issue that I'd love to get an answer to? I can't get my PDF files to show up as thumbnails anymore on Windows 7. They will only show up as the, you know, the Adobe graphic. I can't get, I can't get a thumbnail anymore. And I looked for answers, and other people had that problem too. They thought it was an inherent conflict between Adobe software and Seven. Hmm. Yeah, because we just have the generic. Yeah. PDF icon. And I have so many PDFs I'd love to be able to look at, just like. So we took another step backwards with that. Zach. Like the, the like the thumbnail. Do doesn't work. It's curious, uh, like medium. Medium. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Nothing like big icons. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't work. They still show up with just a generic graphic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I just want to see if you had. Uh, oh, there's. If I get large. If I get big ones. You just have to have huge monsters icons that you can only look at two at a time. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks. It works. It's just two at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I've done a lot of looking on that. No one else can find it. That was brought up as a default. Well, no. okay. But all right. Thanks, Rhonda. But big ones. All right. Big ones. It's part of a solution. So it looks like we've reached the end of our hour. Thanks again. I'm sorry, one more question? I had one, one question about the media capabilities of mm -hmm. 7. Because mm -hmm. uh, I've run into applications said to use either XP Media Center version mm -hmm. or 7. Mm -hmm. is, is it pretty much the same as the Media Center? Is that built in? Yeah, they've built in more of that functionality. Yeah, yeah. There's fewer, fewer versions than we had of XP where they kind of had multiple things out there. But yeah, a lot of that digital capability is now put together inside.